Good morning or good evening wherever you are in the world. I'm Regina Yao and I'm moderating today's Read for Pixels Google Hangout session for the Pixel Project. Through Read for Pixels, um, the Pixel Project is collaborating with award-winning best-selling authors to raise awareness about violence against women and raise funds towards the celebrity male role model Pixel Reveal campaign, which aims to raise $1 million to be shared between the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence and the Pixel Project to keep our efforts to end violence against women alive and kicking. We'll be telling you more about the Reef of Pixels fundraiser, which has lots and lots and lots of exclusive author goodies a little later in the session. And in the meantime, you can find out more about the Pixel Project by visiting www.thepixelproject.net. Today, we have a really awesome guest. We are having a live discussion and fan Q&A session with Yasmin Galanon. Yasmin is the New York Times Publishers Weekly and USA Today best-selling author of the Otherworld series, the Indigo Court series, and the upcoming Fly by Night and Whisper Hollow series. In the past, she has also written two mystery novels for Berkeley Prime Crime, one under the pen name of India Inc., and eight non-fiction metaphysical books. Uh, Yasmin is a caffeine junkie, iced quite short, almond milk sugar free no bit lattes, and describes her life as a blend of teacups and tattoos, the former in her china closet and the latter on her skin. And Yasmin has very generous, generously donated some really great stuff to our um, Indiegogo fundraiser, including a pam panther prowling a pamper basket, which we'll tell you a bit more about later on. There's lots and lots of goodies in there, um, including a signed copy of the latest Otherworld novel, Panther Prowling. And um, you can also um, claim, a uh, generous donor can also claim a name dedication um, in her next book. And there are 10 sets of limited edition character art cards with a personalized thank you note from her. And of course, we also have wallpapers, which have um, for laptops, tablets, and smartphones, which also feature the cover of Panther Prowling alongside other book covers from other urban fantasy and fantasy authors. And they are all covers with kick-ass women characters on them in honor of International Women's Day. And um, and now let's go over to Yasmin. Yes, is here. Hey, Yasmin. Hi there. All right. So let's Today we're going to have this discussion session, and everybody, um, please, please leave your questions on the side. Um, you can ask any questions you want. The Q&A app is open. You can see to the right of the screen. So ask your questions, and I'll read them out to Yasmin, and Yasmin will answer as many as she can. So Yasmin, it's not always easy portraying strong female characters in novels especially women who own their sexuality, like the Dar... Uh, how do we pronounce it? Dartigo? Is it Dartigo? The Artigo yes. sisters, yeah. yeah, in the other world series. So women plus sex, plus an active sex life in many novels tend to be a subject that most writers dance around. How do... how does your work... how do you work around that to create strong female characters who are in touch with their sexuality and not ashamed of it? Well, over the years, I have basically had to own my own sexuality. And as you know, I've come through domestic violence. I came through rape. I came through being molested when I was a kid. And I had to reclaim my own power. I don't think I could write a character without that sort of power in her anymore. Um, to me, it's an essential part of of owning who you are. It's an essential part of being a strong woman in society. Whether that means your sexuality is low-key or a higher drive, that's up to you. But you need to, I, I feel that people need to address and face their own passion and claim it for themselves. And that comes out in many ways. My characters are passionate. And they're passionate about sex, they're passionate about life, they're passionate about their causes. And to me, that all intermingles. And I wrote a book on sex magic when I was uh, 
in my early days of, of writing, and uh, that was to help me reclaim my feelings of not being embarrassed about sexuality, and also to help my readers who had questions about that. So it's a multi multi okay. answer. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you wrote a book on sex magic? Ooh. Yeah, it's called Sex, it like... Ecstasy, and the Divine. Oh, so it's, so it's you know, I'm not well versed with, with magic and Wicca and all that, and um, just curious, it's, so it's, it's more than love charms, right, or love potions? Oh, it's far more than that. It is about finding your own personal sexual power and learning how to claim that and learning how not to abuse it and learning how not to be embarrassed or ashamed of it. So it's it's more exercises than actual spell work. You know, it's a lot of more mm -hmm. personal exercises and meditations and learning how to to get over the guilt that we're often instilled with about our sexuality. I even have, in that book, I have a book, uh, chapter on healing after rape. Because I went through that and there are some magical things that can be done to help if you are a magical practitioner. And so I, it was a hard chapter to write, but I needed to include that because Sexuality is affected by abuse of any sort, and uh, I needed to address how to to cope with that and not let somebody else take your power from you. That is awesome. Is it is it available? Is this the is it available I, to order? I think it is still available. Um, I think you can find it on Amazon. Uh, it's from Ten Speed Press. So. Okay, excellent. So, yours, your, you know, like, like your characters, Car Carmel and M Manoli. Is it Manoli? Do, did I pronounce it's the name correctly? Manoli. Manoli, yeah, it's Manoli. Uh, like Carmel and Manoli, you are also a survivor of sexual violence, like uh, you've mentioned just now. So, um, would you mind sharing with us and the viewers your experience as a survivor? Well, when I was when I was four, I was molested by my stepfather, and I pushed that out of my mind for a long time. And uh, I, I kind of knew that it had happened, but I didn't want to face it. So I always kind of pretended that it really didn't happen. Um, actually, some of my sisters went through abuse of one sort or another, too. At their half sisters. Um, he's my stepfather. Um, when I was 17, I hitchhiked to California. I had to get out of the house. I had got my Associate of Arts degree. I went to college, started college when I was 15, got my Associate of Arts degree, hitchhiked to California with my sister to live with her. And while I was down there, a Coke crazed vet, um, Vietnam vet, who he had PS, um, PTSD, but uh, he raped me when I was 17, and I never told anybody for years. Um, so that happened, and then I got in an abusive marriage and ended up getting beat up at the end of that, nine years later. And that's when I left and I started realizing I needed to do something. I needed to change my patterns so I didn't allow myself to become a victim. And I, I'm not victim blaming at all. I'm just saying that sometimes we don't recognize the patterns we're in and we're, we keep going back to the same type of people because that's what we're familiar with. And that's what I was doing is I was familiar it wasn't comfortable, but I was familiar with being in an abusive relationship, and I didn't have any self-worth. I didn't think I was worth anything better than that, I guess. So when I left my ex, um, it had been nine years of emotional abuse, and the end point was where he blackened my arm from elbow to shoulder. Um, I knew then I had to get out, because next time it would be my face. 
And I would fight back, and I knew that next time I would hit back and one of us would be dead. So I was like, that's it. That's, I'm done. I'm done. And I spent about two years on my own, and I realized I need to figure out what's going on, why I'm drawn to people who hurt me, why I let them in my life. And actually, I went about it in a very analytical way because I knew I couldn't trust my heart. My heart obviously was not quite pointed in the right direction. So I made a list, and I sat down and figured out from my stepfather, through every bad relationship I'd ever had, I made a list of the common denominators that all those people had. And after that, every time I got interested in somebody, I would check them against the list and see if they fit the pattern. Because that was the only way I could actually break it, is to logically look and explore what they had in common. And uh, when I met my current husband, Sam, he didn't fit the pattern at all. And I was just like, whoa, he, he doesn't fit. And it felt very odd at first. And it took me about five years to trust to really trust. And, you know, as I told him, I will never 100% trust anybody again in my life. There's a little part of me I keep sacred and separate and, and safe. But I trust him as much as I can trust anybody in this world at this point. He's earned that trust. And um, part of it was because I broke my pattern and went with somebody who wasn't someone I would have normally thought I'd be with. You know? Yeah, it, it, and, and you know, it's very important um, if there are survivors out there listening to this, uh, watching this YouTube video after this fact or listening right now, um, Yasmin brings up a really, really important point because remember when we were doing a, a test run, Yasmin, and I was telling you about my family and how the pattern just, it just goes through generations. It goes over and over. It does. And my mother was abused. My mother was not only in an abuse, you know, he, my stepfather not only was emotionally abusive to her, but she was abused when she was a kid. I mean, it goes down and down and down. And, and from what I found out, my stepfather abused one of, one of his um, relatives when he was 15. You know, I mean, and it started early with him as an abuser. So it keeps on going. It's cyclic. It, it, until you break that cycle, it will keep perpetuating itself. Yeah, yeah, so you, you it, actively have to take a look and go, I need to break the cycle, I'm willing to do the work. Yeah, it, because you, you know when I mean my, I, like I mentioned, my grandmother had, you know, over half a century, you know, arranged marriage, then half a century of abuse from my granddad, and then my mom left home like you, she left home I think at 18, um, to es escape it, and then marry my dad, and then you and you know, and and one of the things that um, survivors tell us, and we, uh, you know, in the course of the work, is that, um, like you said, you know, you if you're in that cycle, in a way, you if you don't think about it analytically, or take a step back, um, you don't realize that you are continuing like that the relationships around you aren't actually healthy. They aren't right. They, they, they're not. Words, as women, we are taught to be nice, and we are taught not to cut people out of our lives. And I grew willing to cut people out of my life who are toxic. I finally got to a point where it's like, you know, it's either them or me. And they're going. You know, it's like I value my life enough, I value myself enough, and my self-worth is strong enough that I don't deserve abuse. So if someone's going to try and abuse me in my life, they're not going to be in my life anymore. And that that's where, you know, that that's self-care. And self-care is not being selfish. Self-care is actually being healthy. And you know, RJ Lord, yeah, RJ Lord has this really famous quote, I think, about self-care being a radical thing because you know, self-care is rebellion. Self-care is saying, I'm not going to put, I'm not going to be a doormat. I'm going to fight for what I want, but I'm not going to be a doormat, and I'm going to remain healthy while I do that. And, you know, th this sort of segues into 
the next question here, which is, what advice would you give to women? I mean, apart from from you know breaking the pattern that we were talking about, so what advice would you give to women and girls out there who have survived the violence and are now trying to rebuild their lives? Oh, a big one is to do something nice for yourself every single day. Treat yourself the way you would like to be treated because other people will start feeling that and it will single out the people who don't want to treat you right. When I, as it, I mean it's a small thing but when I left my ex I realized he had never given me flowers and I loved flowers and I was like gee I wish I could be with someone who would give me flowers and then I stopped and I went why can't I buy flowers for myself and I was like oh okay so every single week I bought myself flowers and it brightened my mood and it brightened my apartment and it made me feel like I valued myself and that helped build my self-esteem um, I also started taking a look at how I treated my body and I started wearing clothes that I liked and I I started re-evaluating everything that I had done while I was with my ex because one of the simple I mean it sounds stupid but I didn't even know what movies I really liked because every movie we watched I either liked it or disliked it based on what he felt because I didn't want to be called stupid so every now and then I'd watch a movie and I'd go hey I really like this and I thought I didn't and then I realized that so many of my opinions had been based on what he had said but I started reevaluating music and movies and going back and watching things and listening to to uh, groups that I thought I didn't like and I found that I really liked a lot of the groups that I thought I didn't like and I really liked some of the movies I thought I didn't like and conversely some I watched and went oh my god that's stupid why the <laughs> hell did I oh I, I put Samwise my current husband I was uh, I was telling him about this wonderful movie. I loved this movie. It was the most phenomenal movie ever. It was, um, oh, God, what's the movie? Oh, no. It was um, Sean Connery's Zardoz. So mm -hmm. we rented that movie and we watched it. And about 20 minutes in, I was going, what the hell? This isn't the movie I remember. <laughs> I was just like, okay then, I'm sorry I'm putting you through this. I really thought I liked it, but it's really one of the most bizarre, you know, <laughs> bizarre mind mind trips that I've seen. And so, I, you know, it's like I reevaluated everything. I, I went through a two-year period between my ex and meeting meeting Samwise and um, during that time I reevaluated what I liked what I wanted to wear how I felt about the world in general um, I wanted a third cat I got a third cat after my ex you know it's like I started doing things that I wanted to do that I couldn't while I was with him and every time I would hear the voice in my head going you're stupid you're stupid I'd be like, no, I'm stupid if I don't do something I want to do. I'm stupid if I let somebody else make my decisions for me. I started taking myself in hand and reevaluating what I wanted in life. Um, when I was with him, I also did one thing that this is one of the few things I regret because I try not to have regrets. I threw away two book manuscripts trying to save my marriage because he used to tell me if you're successful as an author I'll have to leave you and he would tell me that over and over so I threw away a bunch of my writing trying to save my marriage and that's one thing I regret and after after that I was like you know I'm making a list of things I will never compromise on again there are things I can compromise on these are the things I can't and if somebody can't accept those things about me then then we're not gonna make it you know they're not gonna work in my life so I am 
I think you saw yeah. my shocked expression because you know we've heard you know we hear all 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 sorts of stories from survivors and given that you're an author and he you know he he pretty much made you throw away your manuscripts that and you know all and, and authors are you know their writing is so personal it's an extension of them that's why my jaws kind of dropping because it's like that's that's a pretty pretty much emblematic was, of how much he's control how much he's controlling he was controlling your life yeah and frankly that was worse than getting hit you know I'm I just say it for me that was that was the lowest point getting hit was the part that made me leave but that was the lowest point it's like throwing, throwing away a part of yourself. It is. It really yeah. is. Dad, I'm so glad you left. I'm so glad you left. Many, many girls and women are afraid. You know, many women are afraid to leave. Um, I'm. You know, what struck me is that you had your cats with you. You know, sometimes abusers they actually like use fur babies as hostages. Yes, well, and you cannot he, leave. He actually liked the cats and. When we broke up, I kicked him out. I was making more money than he was at that point, and I was like, "You have to leave." And I told him, "I'm keeping the cats." Period. And so, you know, he left. He did. Um, it took a few months to get him out, and he wanted to come around and see the cats. And for a little while, I let him. And then I realized every time he came, he made me feel like crap. So I, I put, you know, I pretty much put an end to it at uh, at one point. Um, and I moved, you know, it's like I, I wouldn't let anything happen to my cats. They're my kids. And for me, my mother didn't protect me. I loved her, but she did not protect me. I would never not protect my cats. Yeah, it's yeah. I'm just you know I was I was feeling so glad that you you know you kept your cats with you because we do get so many women just don't leave because they can't take their cat with them their dog with them um, that the abuser which threatened to kill the dog or the cat and a lot of a lot of times um, they've done studies on this that um, you you can tell if someone's going to be a, an abuser if they if they torture animals when they're right. kids. Yeah, and that leads also, that's um, a sign of a possible potential budding serial killer, too. Yeah, it, it's so, it's, that means they have no empathy. It's, it's being, so, you know, they're budding sociopaths. And we, we hear about that because, you know, we have another campaign called People and Pets Say No. And I'll send you the links after this, but every year, people everywhere gather together um, with their pets. They have a picture taken and they hold up a sign saying, we say no. So it's them and a the fur baby say no to violence against women and no to people holding fur babies hostage and killing them, you know, just to control women and kids. So, oh, you know, yeah. it's, yeah. I think I, I've got the type of personality, even back then, I would have fought back for them faster than I would have for me, far faster. You know, because animals, they can't stand up for themselves, you know, and I've always known that. And I've always, to, to me, my animals have always been a part of myself. They're a part of my life, you know. It's like I would never move someplace I couldn't take them. I, I lived in a converted school bus and I had my cats with me. <laughs> You know, at one point after I left my ex, I bought a converted school bus. I quit my job. I moved into the bus with my cats, and I slept with a hatchet by my head because nobody could have heard me on the back end of five acres. But I had my cats with me. And it was also I, in my list of I will not compromise. It's like if I ever get involved with anybody again, they have to love cats. Not tolerate them, but love them. And... Sure enough, Samwise loves cats, you know. <laughs> yeah, you, you know that you talk about animals not being able to protect themselves, but we also have heard of cases. Have you heard of this um, about a couple years back? 
it was horrendous. It, um, there was a case, um, I can't remember in which state, but um, the abuser came after the woman with a hammer, a sledgehammer, and her great dame stood up for her and got her out of there. They literally leapt out the window, but the great dame couldn't, you know, he got his Heinrich smashed by that maniac. And because she wouldn't go into a shelter, a neighbor's trying to get her to a shelter, the shelter doesn't take animals. Many don't because they don't have the resources to right. accommodate uh, pets as well. But, you know, because of him and his her Great Dane and his bravery, they started accommodating pets. Um, and he stood so up. Important. That is so right. important. I mean, yeah. even... Yeah, even during Hurricane Katrina, people were not going to the shelters because they couldn't take their pets. I think as a nation, we need, we really need to identify just how valuable these these creatures are to our lives and start making accommodations for them. Because they are family. I know people who their only family is their pets. You know, they'd be lost without them. And... Yeah. There are several states now that have just passed legislation saying that pets also deserve um, sanctuary in domestic violence situations. I think one of them is Massachusetts. Um, I think California as well and Ohio, if I'm not mistaken. We've been getting, you know, we, we curate the Pixel Project team shares a lot of links on Twitter, yeah, and on, on Facebook, and we curate a lot. We go through lots and lots of headlines every day, and what's standing out to us is that more and more states are, are you know, are... Uh, mandating that you know animals in domestic violence situations also get shelter, they also oh, get good. get fostered, and you know animals are also you know in um, therapy for domestic violence and rape survivors. Um, animals are also used therapy dogs, and there's a case in New York a couple of years ago where a 15 year old girl had to face her rapist in court. And what made it different, and he got convicted, is um, they had a therapy dog with her, a golden retriever or Labrador, I can't remember. And he, they, uh, the court allowed her to have the dog with her in the witness stand. And oh, that she, is good. She said that if she didn't have the dog with her, and he, the dog, you know, was trained, and you know, she could pet him, keep stroking him while she was shaking, and you know, the dog would lick her while she was giving her testimony. She, she said if the dog wasn't there, she wouldn't have been able to go through it. She wouldn't have been able to pull through. But she did, and her rapist is now in jail. And, Good. yeah. Um, so let's go back to talking about books and pop culture and violence against women. And, you know, in, in as a novelist, how important, in your opinion, is it to have strong female characters, not just in books, but in pop culture as a whole? I think it's it's invaluable because it gives young women role models. And you know, when I was okay, I was on Twitter last night. I was just rambling, and I was talking about when I was a little girl. And when I was a little girl, I wanted to be a writer and I loved dinosaurs, and I loved volcanoes, and I loved spaceships, and I loved science fiction, but all the heroes were guys, and all the archaeologists were guys, pretty much, and a lot of, most of the writers I read were guys, you know, because I was reading Heinlein and Bradbury and Arthur C. Clarke by the time I was eight years old, and it made it harder to believe I could become that. Because there weren't a lot of women back then. Um, I, I'm just stubborn enough that I, I was like, I'm going to make it no matter what. But a lot of little girls, they aren't taught to be stubborn. They're taught to be nice. And they aren't ta taught to be, uh, <laughs> sorry, they aren't taught to dream big. So when they see these role models who look like real people who look like women they know who are strong in many ways not just not just kick-ass heroines but 
inside kick-ass harems, women who won't take crap, women who are positive and strong and happy and not willing to let their lives be be made miserable by other people. When little girls see these heroes, these heroines, they think I could become that too. You know, and I'm sorry, the Disney princesses, nobody looks like that, except unless you're extremely narrow range of society. And the the princesses aren't there to take charge of their own life. You know, I never wanted to be Cinderella. I never wanted to be rescued. Yeah, I, I mean, I went through a phase where it was like I was in love with Anna and the King of Siam, and that seemed all just extremely exotic and happy and beautiful. And I think it was because I watched The King and I, and I loved the singing and the dresses and stuff. But, but I never wanted to be the princess. I wanted to be the adventurer. And I think that a lot of little girls were told they couldn't be that. So when they see Buffy, when they see a Lost Girl, when they see, oh, ow, even Murder, she wrote with, you know, Angela Lansbury, you know, the detective, the writer detective. When they see these women in in the main roles who are making a strong life for themselves. It makes them think they could do it. I mean, I yeah. love pop culture. I love it. And uh, sometimes I love things I probably shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I think I'm a generation younger than you. And, um, and when I was growing up, you know, we watched Star Wars. And we watch Indiana Jones, and we watch, you know, all, all in the 80s and in the 90s. And and uh, you know what my favorite part of Star Wars was? Princess Leia. Princess oh, Leia, yeah. who didn't take any, you know, didn't take crap from 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 Han Solo. She, you know, she she did her best. She rescued herself. I mean, Luke Skywalker opened the door for her. Yeah, but. But after that, you know, she, she, she just dove in and she, she stood up for herself. And that was, like, my favorite part of Star Wars because there weren't that many, like you said, there weren't that many women. There weren't that many women and girls in, who had an active, proactive role with agency in, in stories that, that were being told in pop culture, and, you know, in the late 20th century and before that. Um, but, but now, you know, they, they, you know, someone on Tumblr talked about, gave, it, gave a name to a phenomenon that's happening now. Uh, she called it the Hermione effect. And, she's, and it's because there's been an influx of strong, of, of well-rounded female characters who have, uh, who, have, who have agency in, you know, young adult, people like Katniss Aberdeen and oh, yeah. uh, Chris mm -hmm. and uh, who else is, who else? Um, yeah, there's a uh, Prudence Prudence Macken in the latest book by Gail Carriger. Let's see. Um, there's Cassandra Class books. There's Sarah J. Mathis books and stuff. It, it seems this influx of really, really lively and uh, lively and kick-ass female characters in young adults, and it's great for girls. But um, what are your thoughts on this? You know. Do you think this is it's just a trend, or do you think this is this is here to stay? I think it needs to be here to stay. And oh, there was okay. There was a site the other night. This this is sort of almost parallel to it. They were talking about well, is it trendy? Is it becoming too much of a trend to give parts um, to people of color? on television shows is it becoming too trendy and it's like what is this about a trend we're reflecting society's diversity and women are a good share of society so to have strong women characters only reflects part of society that is you know it, it, it reflects half of society at least um, there are a lot of books out there with strong male characters already. There will always be books out there 
for boys and for men. We need to continue to have books out there that reinforce women being able to own their own power. And I guess that's a phrase I use a lot, owning your own power. It's not having power over somebody, it's having power for yourself, making your own choices and learning that you can make a difference in the world, that you can make a difference in your own life, that you can that you can make your own life. You don't have to wait to be rescued. You don't have to accept somebody else's vision of yourself. And granted, we work together. I mean, you know, men and women can work together to make things happen, but it's not a matter of the men are always the the strong, you know, virile types and the women are always the cheerleader, go, go, honey types. <laughs> um, you know, what people are as diverse as, as snowflakes. You know, it's, I'm, I'm stronger willed in some ways than my husband, but that doesn't mean he's not a strong willed person. We have our own strengths, we balance each other out. Um, you know, it's, we just, we're who we are. We don't play into gender roles. And I think that's an important thing is getting rid of specific gender roles and stereotypes and letting the characters be who they need to be. If I ever need to write a weak woman character, I will, but that will be probably to either emphasize that she needs to become stronger or to emphasize that, you know, sometimes there are people who do have weaknesses. And it doesn't make them bad people. It just, it's not exactly the healthiest thing. No. Yeah. And, you know, what I noticed is that um, in young adult books, because I, I read a lot of young adult books, I read a lot of urban fantasy, um, and fantasy and sci-fi, and one notice is, you know, even if if, you, if we talk about characters that can be good good role models for kids, you know, like they can see it, you know, and because kids is, kids get so much, you know, they're so influenced by pop culture, um, you know, for male characters, I don't know what you, what you think about this, but I thought that for male characters, they could, you know, writers could stand to move away from, you know, these kick-ass male characters who are very, like you say, virile and, you know, they get the girl and and all that and, and just show them as more human, you know, how what's wrong with showing a male character who, who's in touch with his emotional side? What's exactly. wrong with... Showing them as well-rounded. Showing every character as a well-rounded person as opposed to a cardboard cutout. Yeah. And getting kind of tired of alpha males, like every romance book or adventure book, they all seem to have alpha males. And um, uh, I think that there was a discussion on a book forum about Georgette Heyer's books. Have you read Georgette Heyer? Uh, actually, I know who she is, but she is one author I have never actually had the pleasure of reading at this point. I read Daphne du Maurier. <laughs> she is. Um, she is. One of the best Regency. Well, she passed away. Um, she her books are some of the best Regency era romances and mysteries uh, around because they're, they're so well written and they're so well researched. And it's the world that she's best in. And we're talking about this. Um, you know, all her romantic heroes in her romances, and one of them stood out. That all the the discussions revolving around him and his. Called uh, the Honorable Freddie Stanton, and what was unusual about him that everyone agreed about was that he's not the usual alpha male. You know, he's not the one to pick up the woman and toss her in the carriage and bear her away. He, you know, he's not a rogue. He's he's not a Corinthian, which is you know one of those you know athletes kind of those oh. alpha males. Yeah. But he he's called a pink. He's a pink of the ton, which is a very fashionable man. He's 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 not big and imposing. He's slim. He's well dressed, and throughout the book, you know, he he just helped his, you know, his the female love interest. You know, he just helped her along. You know, they started out as friends, and then along the way, they both discovered that they're very well suited. And at the end, he said something that made everybody want to cry. 
he said um, he thought that you know she's still in love with the alpha male, and he said to her very frankly in a carriage, you know, he said to her, you know, I just want you to have everything you want. I just want you to be happy. Just wish it was me, not Jack. That's all. And every all the women were like. Men should say stuff like this, you know. They should approach us like this, you know. They should, they should know what, you know, how they feel, you know. They should, should, should be frank with it instead of all these games and alpha male nonsense and stuff like that. And you know, that that was what we were chatting about. And you know, I, I don't think I've seen a comparable hero in contemporary fiction. Have you? Someone who's like that, who's sensitive, and who actually comes out and has a frank conversation with you know, the, his female counterpart talking about their feelings and emotions and they actually sort it out. She goes like, oh, oh, you know, she, she goes like, well, you know, I realize that, you know, you're much more steady and all that than the alpha male and then they have a, they have a sane conversation, let's put it this way, about feelings and emotions and he got the girl. He's <laughs> not the biggest, he's not the most alpha, he's, he's not the most dashing, but he got the girl by, by dint of the fact that he's reliable and he helps her along and you know, and they, they just find that they're suited. I mean, have you seen any? I don't think I've seen that many in modern... I yeah, I, I don't... I don't think I've seen that many, although I have seen... I have seen a few more well-rounded characters, but a lot of my reading is extremely widespread. So I read thrillers, I read mysteries, I, you know, it's like I read a, a wide variety of things. And a lot of times, I will say, I do tend to read more women writers because their characters have more emotional impact to me, male and female. Um... I'm not, I write some alpha males, but I always try to make some flaws in there, you know, and not just, not just the wounded king type, type flaw, because that, while I have written that once or twice, it kind of annoys me at times. <laughs> it's like, yeah, if somebody is wounded, they may need some therapy, you know, <laughs> more than, more than needing a relationship, they may need some therapy first, but I like characters with flaws. I like characters who can break down. And honestly, um, I think one of, and this is pulling back to my own work, I think one of the scenes that hit me the most with my male characters was when Camille's, one of her husband's, Trillian, admitted he had been um, abused in, when he was a prisoner of war. And when he talked to her about that, because honestly, I've had I've had male friends who have been raped, and it's almost harder for them to talk about than than it is for women to talk about it, because they get made fun of, and they they get guys going, oh, you know, you should have just enjoyed it, and it's like, you know, guys get raped by men and women, and I've I've known too many who have. So I wanted to address that in my own work too. You know, sexual abuse is across the board. And I felt it needed to be addressed in a in a hero, you know. To have a hero go, this happened to me. And here's how I dealt with it. And have him be able to talk to his partner about it. So, so now that we are on the topic, you know, what are your thoughts as an author on including violence against women in, sto in your stories? Because some attempt it and do it very well. You know, like Robert J. Sawyer, he had um, not a rape scene, but he had, you know, he, he read a scene where, you know, uh, a rape survivor, the protagonist, uh, approached the rape crisis center to, uh, to get help. And it was extremely well written, and he said he did a ton of research. He talked to many, many rape survivors before he even attempted it. And then there are other authors like Shauna McGuire who are committed to not using sexual violence in their fiction, 
so they don't trigger any survivor any survivors among the readers. So what's your take on it? Well, I do I do have several scenes in some of my books. I mean, mentally was tortured and raped, you know, and Camille there was a very rather explicit scene where she was attacked and raped. Um, for me, what I want to show is that it is not glorious, it is not titillating, it is not it does not turn into this passionate thing. What it is is violence, what it is is an attack and I like to show how they can come through it and grow beyond it and grow stronger than their attackers. You know, how they can turn around and go, you're not going to define my life. This happened to me, it will always affect me, but you're not going to define my life, you're not going to keep the power you tried to take from me. Um, because it is such a part of life, and it's a part of my life, because it happened to me in my past, you know. there I can't ignore the fact that it's there. I can't ignore the fact that it happens, because... I went through it and it changes you forever but I like to show that it can happen and when it does happen it doesn't have to be the end and you can come through it and you know every all the attackers in my books though they do get punished and that's kind of my own punishment toward my attackers <laughs> because you know my rapist was you know I never reported it I was 17 and I was drunk and I knew what the cops would say back then because this was back in 79 or 78 I knew what the cops would say if I reported it um, my stepfather you know when I told my mother I told her when I was 31 and her answer was well I know you were abused but it was in a different lifetime she tried to make it, you know, some metaphysical thing. She didn't want to admit. She knew it happened, but she didn't want to admit it. Um, so none of the people who ever attacked me got punished that I know of. So I kind of take care of that in my books. It's my own yeah. way. Of, it's my own way of dealing with it. It's my own way of saying, you know, there are repercussions for what you do. What you do will come back. You know, what you do will play out and there are repercussions. You know, if you act in a wonderful way, if you are good to people, if you if you do your best to make this world a better place, it will be felt. If you do the if you do your best to make this world a painful place, it's you know Somebody somewhere will try and take care of this. You know, you, you'll feel it one way or another. Yeah, it's karma. I'm Buddhist and we call it karma, you know. So it's, we, we believe that, you know, whatever, it's kind of like physics, but every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So if you don't get your comeuppance now, you're going to get it somewhere down the road. And hopefully they will. But, you, you know, what you said about not reporting, you know, Madonna talked about it recently as well. She was raped when she first got to New York City, and she talked about it on the Howard Stern show. And she said, you know, when Howard Stern asked her why she didn't report it, she says, are you kidding? It's yeah. almost going to be almost more traumatic reporting it, almost as traumatic reporting as the act as itself. As going through it. Oh, yeah, and mm -hmm. I knew that. I knew that for a while. Um, I was staying with my sister in California. Um, she's she's now passed. She uh, died in 1986. But I was staying with her, taking care of her kids, and it was her boyfriend. And she went to bed one night. She had a headache, and um, you know I was drunk, and I admit it. I was you know I drank when I was that age, and uh, he raped me, and I knew that if I told my sister she would go out and she would take care of him herself and I was afraid that her kids would be left without a mother because she would get caught and put in jail and if I reported it to the cops it would be my fault so I just didn't say anything 
and now hopefully you know hopefully the viewers are watching this and the viewers who watch it watch the recording after this you know hopefully things things have not changed too much but you know more and more people are calling out you know the whole rape culture victim blaming thing and that's why we you know we're starting to have um, we're starting to have uh, scandals like you know the Bill Cosby Bill Cosby oh, scandal yes. yeah yes. and and well, you know what? What gets me about the Bill Cosby thing, and you know, I was ranting about this together with Cami Garcia um, on her Google Hangout. Is we were both ranting about it, is more than thirty women have come forward, and there are still people who say that the women are making it up. There's still people who think that that's a conspiracy theory. They don't so, like having their worldview of somebody changed, you know, and that's a real problem when when you don't want to accept something so you try to write off the evidence that's a real problem um, I, I go on rants occasionally on Twitter about it I try not to rant too much because honestly who wants to see somebody just ranting all the time <laughs> but now and then I do go off on some of these cases because it just drives me up the freaking wall and I notice that I will gain some followers and I will lose some from that and it's like you know if they're fun following me because they don't want to hear that I don't approve of somebody getting off for a rape case or something well that's fine you know they didn't need to be following me in the first place mm -hmm. um, and speaking of that social media is a very odd thing um, I almost left Twitter a few years ago because someone who had been following me, I found out I had been talking to him, you know, like nothing, mm -hmm. you know, and then I found out he had been convicted of raping a nine-year-old girl for a couple years, and he was HIV positive and he knew it, and that almost sent me off of Twitter because I was just like, how can I be talking to someone? I didn't know it. But I was talking to him. I was nice to him, and I felt so horrible that I had been interacting with this person. Um, I know we can't always know. We don't always know who we're talking to. But that was a very hard thing for me. That was probably one of my latest traumas dealing with what you call sexual violence or something. Is just the emotional impact of realizing I had been interacting with this person who had raped a nine-year-old and I was just like how do I deal with this in my mind how do I handle the emotions and uh, it was it was difficult for a while it was it was very hard for me to to come back to interacting with people mm -hmm. I mean social media you, you can't you can't tell who you're talking to sometimes because all you can see is their handle so you know it's it's hard it, it's difficult but yeah oh so now so talking about social media you know there's a lot of kerfuffles really big kerfuffles going on over the last couple, last two to five years on social media you know with women women like Anita Sarkeesian getting getting attacked game and game, yeah Gamergate yeah. and I was gonna ask you know geek culture in general has a show of critics saying that it's still too male dominated despite a number of prominent female authors and you know comic book creators and and game creators uh, you know like you uh -huh. like, and what do you think what do you think needs to be done to make geek culture as a whole more welcoming for women more inclusive more welcoming for women and girls and 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 other um, other demographics who haven't traditionally been in geek culture. I think one of the, the uh, I've been thinking about this issue for a while. Um, I know some women computer programmers and stuff, and just the fact that I have to qualify that by women computer programmers shows you that there was a problem. If we didn't have to qualify it with women or, you know, she's a woman comic book artist, you know, if we didn't have to qualify it, then things would probably be more even, but we still have to qualify it. Um, I it it's a complex problem. I don't have a solution, but 
I think one thing that helps is for men who are men who are enlightened. Let's put it that way. When they see guys making all these sexist cracks or you know being an asshole on World of Warcraft or whatever, when they see guys doing this, for them to say, "Hey, stop! I don't want to be around it. I'm not going to play into it." You know, it's like this is one time when we do need men on our side because they are a predominant part of that culture still. And to, it's just like when women were going for the vote. We needed men to vote for women to get the vote. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was. Um, uh, you know, there's a, uh, the the BBC. I think the BBC recently had a documentary about the suffragettes, and to, you were, you're right. To get the vote, they had to the suffragettes. Not you know, they they did all sorts of really really extreme you know extremely militant stuff, which needed to be done. But one of the things that they did was they got their husbands and they got they got sympathetic. Sympathetic uh, politicians, male politicians, to vote for the vote. Yeah, in essentially, it's not a man versus woman thing. It's a an equality versus inequality, you know. And the inequality are those who would prefer to keep women barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen or whatever their version of that is. And the more enlightened side are the ones who go, hey, you know, so what if she's female? It's like, I, I have played Dungeons & Dragons since I was 18. I have run Dungeons & Dragons for years. I, I play old school. I like to play around the table with the dice. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, when I first started playing, I was it was all guys. I was the only woman there. They were pretty nice. Except there were a couple that kept testing me when I started taking over as the dungeon mistress. And they would throw dice to see if they could land them down my bra. And what? What? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they would sit there and throw dice at me to see if they could hit it down my shirt. And I never... I didn't yell at them, per se. I didn't even acknowledge it. I would just pull the dice out and toss it back on the floor and then they would try to cause havoc in the dungeon and I just kept control and after a couple of years they stopped doing that and it was like they became much more open to having women in the game and I think it's because I kept my control I didn't let them shake me. you know I didn't it was it was almost like dealing with rats, you know. <laughs> you deal with a little kid who is throwing a tantrum. If you respond in the same way, they're gonna just it's gonna ex exacerbate things on both sides. I just I played the mom. I mean that sounds horrible, but I just played, you know. Yeah, okay, we're done with that now. Let's move on. Let's get back to the game. Are you done now? Okay, let's get back to the game. Yeah. And pretty soon they stopped. But we need we need the guys we need the guys out there who welcome our presence to stand up and say, you know, hey, stop that. You know, she doesn't deserve this. Hey, stop that. You're you're treating a fellow human being like crap. You know, I and that's the point. You're treating a fellow human being. It's not just be nice because she's a lady. It's like she's a person. Stop this. Yeah, you know Chuck Wendig. Have you met Chuck Wendig? Um, I haven't met him, but I've talked to him on Twitter a lot. Yeah, Chuck stands up for this. You know, he he has this theory. Do you read that blog post? He has this theory that you know all all, all these guys in geek culture who are real, you know, throw, you know, who are being really nasty to women, they're doing that because they know they're going to be extinct soon. Kind of like uh -huh. dying. He, he likened them to dinosaurs to see the meteors coming, and so are having a temper tantrum. And I started yeah. laughing because it's true. I think it's true. It's like, you know, they're seeing the end of one phase in geek culture, and they're witnessing, you know, the ushering in of the next phase, which is more diversity, more women, more minorities, more LGBT, more people of color. And it's a good thing. And it, it has, um, there's an article which I'm going to send you after this. It, it, it was written in The Guardian. 
you know, talking about how how comic, uh, female comic book characters have evolved over the years and how geek culture has affected that and how um, how more women in the industry and more women readers have female readers have affected the changes that have happened for the positive and I, I was going to say this you know when I was a teenager I started reading my sister and I started reading comic books and um, here's the cool thing this was back in the 90s but the the people who sold us comic books they're women the shopkeeper was a woman and she sold comic books to kids boys and girls and you know there was never any question of whether you had the right as some some of the guys in the geek world say to be a geek and when I went you know when in college I went to a different comic book shop because I moved to England and it was run by a guy and he was one of those guys who stood up for you know female fans at the time we were all guys and just me and you know his policy was to not harass other readers regardless of their gender or sexual orientation and all and you know it's so nice but you know we hear a lot about women not feeling comfortable going into comic book stores or certain parts of conventions still so I was I will admit that after coming from that so that self experience I was quite surprised when I found out just how how much black women are taking in the in geek culture right now oh yeah yeah and you know the thing is I don't think it matters whether whether the women are stereotypically beautiful or whether they are like myself large or whether they are smart or what they're doing the fact is that they're female you know no matter what, they will find something to pick on. Um, I've been watching a lot of conventions over the past few years. I've been watching a lot of the the problems going on with the conventions, and it's made me pull back from a lot of them because, well, honestly, a couple of times I've been on panels at a couple of the sci-fi conventions where I was the best-selling author there. I had the most experience. And I was kind of shunted off to the side and talked over. And it's hard to talk over me. But these guys managed to try and talk over me. And it was like I was the token female. You know, and I was sitting there going, uh, excuse me. You know? <laughs> and it made me go, why, why bother? Why do I want to go back to that? You know, it's like... I have umpteen books out. I have this much experience in this in publishing. I have I have a background of science fiction and fantasy. I'm a dungeon mistress for God's sakes. You know, it's like I fit on this panel. Give me my voice. Let me have my voice. Quit trying to talk over me. So I, I quit going to a lot of the sci-fi convention and um, one of the last ones I went to when I was assigned to lead a panel called Intoxicants of the Future which was held in the bar that kind of did it for me it's like I don't hardly drink anymore what the hell am I supposed to say about booze of the future in a bar I think this is a drinking panel you know, I'm not going to sit there and talk to a bunch of guys who are getting drunk. They had it in a bar? Uh-huh. Um, this is like the umpteen time my, my jaws dropped this, this Google Hangout. It's, what? I thought you had, like, convention halls and stuff for panels, not a Well, it, it was in a hotel, you know, and I'm not going to name the convention because... Honestly, I think I think they do the best they can on what what they're going on, but it was obviously not the convention for me. Um, but yeah, they, they they held the panel in the hotel bar, and another panel they put me on was to discuss the problems with urban fantasy taking and and stuff like that taking over the place of science fiction, and I. 
I stood up there and was like, okay, I am the one taking over the science fiction if that's what your problem is. <laughs> let's turn this panel into a, let's talk about publishing and how to best approach publishers if you're worried about not being able to get to a publisher. You know, it's like I, I was given the weirdest panels. It was, it was like they had no clue of what to do with me. Oh. All right, so we're going to have to wrap up soon. Um, if anyone out there has any questions, I know you guys are watching. I can see your numbers. If you guys have any questions, you know, please, you know, Ask drop now. It in. Ask while yeah. I'm here. Yeah, ask now. Just type it in. It's on the right of your screen. It says, you know, questions. Type in your questions here, and I'll read it out the Yasmin. But um, so, so you know, le leading up from that, so you know, in your opinion, how can authors like yourself best support efforts to kick up social change to end violence against women? By being vocal about it, by not being afraid to speak out. Um, there has been a bit of a kerfuffle lately in the authorial community about how much we should speak out about our political beliefs and our our stances and some people say keep your mouth shut because you'll turn off readers if you come out with a differing opinion well you know what years ago I put a sign on my website when it was coming near election day all I said was vote it didn't say vote for this, vote for that, vote for this party. It just said vote. I got email from people going, how dare you tell me to go vote? I'm turning my books back into the store. And I was like, okay then, you know, I'm a person. I feel we should vote. I, have an, I am not just an author. I am a human being with opinions. To me, there are things that go beyond business, and violence against women is something that is so inherent, so much a part of my background in terms of being a, a survivor of it. How can I not speak out about it? And if some readers don't want to listen to me talk about it, if some people get upset, too bad. They can go read somebody else because, you know, this issue goes beyond business. It goes beyond being politically neutral. Um, you got to talk about it. I I speak out about my own experiences to shed light on it and to make women out there who are still hiding the fact that they're being abused realize it's not something you should be ashamed of. This is not a shameful thing. It is what is shameful is the person doing it. That's the person who should be ashamed, not you. The victim should never be ashamed. You can become a survivor. You can get through this. It's hard work. It is, and it involves a lot of tears. But there's a light at the end of that tunnel, and you need to hold on to that. And if I can come through what I've come through in my background and make it to where I'm at, you can come through and have a good life. You can come through and make a life for yourself. You know, don't be afraid to step out of that familiar zone. It may not be comfortable. It may hurt. But a lot of times we get stuck in a familiar rut because it's all we know. Don't be afraid to move out of it. As authors, as, as people who have an audience, we need to speak out about those things that matter to us. And you know, yeah, we'll lose some readers here, but we'll gain more there. And, and in the end, it evens out. And in the end, what matters is that we do what's right. Yeah, you know, every author who, who's worked with us, they had, you know, just about all of them share this opinion. You know, if you don't speak out about issues like abuse, violence against women, rapes, you know, sexual assault, female genital mutilation, you know, it. Like you said, it goes beyond business. This is about. This is about. This is about people. This is about life. This is about. This is about shedding light into the corners that we need to shed light into. Because if you don't expose this stuff, it will go on and it will perpetuate. When you start shining a light on someone, going that person beat up his wife. 
it's harder for him to do it again. When you take someone to court, it's harder for them to do it again. You know, when you reach your hand out to a survivor or to a victim and say, you can be a survivor, you have to take a few steps. You have to make the choice, but you can come out of that. You know, it, then they have the option. Then they know they have an option to do this. It's when you're isolated and abuse is, abuse isolates people. It's when you keep that isolation going that people get trapped for good. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, I sometimes wonder, like you said, I sometimes wonder if, you know, if people had, you know, everyone, like my mom grew up in a small town. I mentioned that my grandma had, you know, all 50 years of domestic violence from my granddad. And everyone in a small, you know, small towns, yeah? Everyone will know what's happening in general with everyone else. And nobody said a thing. And you know, can you imagine if someone actually said something? It might have ended very differently, um, yeah. and, you know. And, and you know, and with, and that's why you know, my team and myself and everyone who supports us, we've been so happy lately because people are really starting to speak out. You know, with Reap for Pixels, you know, I will be very honest. When we started this, we are like, when we started this, is because more than half of us on the team are geeks. We love reading. We love. Some of them read comic books, some do gaming, you know, Dungeons and Dragons and, and online and stuff. And and we thought, you know, authors have something really important to say because authors, when we read books, we are reading about the human condition. Authors are translating the human condition into stories that we can digest and, you know, and think about. And when we started, we had no idea what you know whether authors would be up for this, and I w I'm very happy to say that so many are. So many, we, you know, we have, we, we're so happy to have authors like you support us, and authors like you support the movement to end violence against women because you all have a voice, and you're not afraid to use it. You know, having you talk today about your experience, hopefully. The viewers out there will maybe maybe it might save someone's life. Yes, man. Someone might some a woman somewhere might be sitting there thinking, yeah, maybe it's time that I got out of this, and they might think that. I, I have noticed it. over the years that I ever ever since ever since I started talking about this, and I've talked about this for years. Ever since I wrote the sex magic book, actually. Mm -hmm. Because in that book I came out as being, I had been raped and I talked about stuff. And ever since then I have gotten letters. And since social media started, I've gotten notes on Twitter and, and on Facebook and email from people going, thank you for talking about this because it happened to me and I don't feel like I'm so alone. And that's the thing, we need to make women realize they aren't alone. There are resources out there to help. There are people out there who care. There are people out there who've been through this. You aren't alone. You you aren't the only one who's been through this. Other people will understand. Yeah. So one last question and it's kind of a Captain Obvious question but you know you've been so supportive of our Read for Pixels campaign and our anti-violence against, against women work as a whole. Um, so, you know, just out of curiosity, why, you know, why do you say yes? Because not every author say yes to our invitation. So why do you say yes? Because we're tiny. We're not Amnesty. We're not, we're not NCADV. So we, we're just wondering, you know, why, why, why you decided to support us in our work. When I, when you asked, when you first came and I got the email on, I looked up the organization and I saw what you guys were doing. I was like, I can do something to help. Um, you know, every organization out there that's trying to do work on this is is reaching another portion of society. Maybe you're reaching somebody that rain isn't going to reach. Maybe you're reaching some. You're reaching out to other countries as well, and I think that's very important. And I've got, 
I've got a readership. How can I not help? That that's my answer is how can I not do this? You know, I mean, yeah, I'm a very busy person. I I'm swamped, but you know, for stuff like this, how can I not help? No. Oh. Thank you so much. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, to wrap it up. I'm going to trot out this little slide that we put together. Hang on. You, sh you tell me if you see it. Mm, I don't. Oh, there it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, so everybody out there, as mentioned earlier, uh, Yasme has donated very generously to the Read for Pixels campaign. And um, these goodies that she's donated um, are there um, as giveaways to donors who fulfill certain donation asks. So um, her goodies include a special uh, Panther Prowling uh, Pamper Pack. And it includes a signed copy of her latest Otherworld novel, Panther Prowling, who doesn't love Delilah. And various swag goodies, including three packs of wristbands of Men of the Other World and Women of the Other World, 13 in all their shades, Smokey, Trillian, Morio, Maggie, Camille, Delilah, Manoli, Narissa, Iris, Cecily, Lennon, and Grieve. Did I yeah. pronounce it? Those last three, Lennon, Grieve, and Cecily are from the Indigo Court series. So. Okay. And then there are also two packs of art cards, one of Men of the Other World and the other is Women of the Other World, and there are nine cards in all, and these are specially commissioned by Yasmin. Um, and there's Moonstalkers, pen, button, po and post-it note pads, and an indigo cord owl perfume vial and moonstone. And uh, the second good uh, goodie that uh, Yasmin has donated is a name dedication to the donor in her next book. So you can get that and... Oh, there's a oh, you can get that, and uh, there's a question that's just coming, Yasmin, but we'll finish okay. this announcement first. So, and there's a um, name dedication to donor in her next book, and you can get that for yourself, or you can get it for as a really unique gift for a per, for someone you know. Um, and this is not a very common thing. Let me tell you this: this is the once in a blue moon thing. Authors I have don't. Only, I have only done this one other time. Okay. Um, and um, for those who have smaller amounts to donate, there are 10 sets of limited edition character art cards with a personalized thank you note from Yasmin, and that's um, one pack of that set in, will include one pack of the Men of the Other World and a second pack of the, and another pack of um, the other pack would be the Women of the Other World, nine cards in all. And we also have sets of wallpapers for laptops tablets and smartphones, which include the cover of Panther Prowling alongside other book covers with kick gas protagonists on them. Um, and you can go to is.gd stroke r4p indiegogo iwd to donate to get these geeky goodies. Or if you have uh, PayPal, if you only have PayPal, you go to is.gd stroke r4p resume iwd. And you can find out more about Read for Pixels at is.gd stroke read for pixels. It is all, um, it is all um, case sensitive. And if you want to learn more about the Pixel Project, you can go to um, www.thepixelproject.net. Now we have one question, Yasmin, from a fan um, called Mika Spray, and she says, "Hi, Yasmin. You've decided to continue um, Other World yourself. OW, I think that's Other World yourself in time. Mm -hmm. What's driving that decision apart from the publisher deciding not to buy more Other World, Other World books? Are there specific stories you want to get out?" A I want to finish the series, and I don't want my readers to be let, left hanging. Um, so there will be at least three more books after Darkness Raging that I will be putting out on my own. Um, I also plan on doing other, you know, novelettes on my own. In between, in fact, I've got Men of Other World Collection Two going up on April seventh. So I'll be doing more shorts on my own. Um, there's a potential for spin-offs. I mean, Fly by Night, which Berkeley is putting out, is a spin-off with different characters. But I've got other ideas, and those may eventually be done 
uh, self-published or it depends on whether a publisher is interested in them. So there's so much in that world that I'd like to do and it doesn't just involve the DRT Go sisters. There's just so many characters that catch my fancy that it, it's sort of like uh, like having an entire world that's my playground. So, so yeah, my I, I don't want to leave my readers hanging, you know. Okay, so that's done. So, I think we it's it's coming up to it's coming up to the end of the Google Hangout. So everybody, thank you so much for watching. Um, Yasmin, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, and um, please do, everyone, please do go check out the Indiegogo page. Um, you can also go to find it online if you don't have the direct link. Um, yes, and we'll keep tweeting it out and sharing on Facebook. We'll keep tweeting it out and sharing it too. But uh, you can always just type in Indiegogo, the Pixel Project, IWD 2015, and it'll give you the direct link to the page. So thank you all so much. Have a good evening or a good morning, a good day ahead, wherever you are in the world. This is Regina Yao and Yasmin Galanon signing out. And um, be safe, and it's time to stop violence against women together. <laughs>